Good morning, dear participants. It's a great pleasure to welcome you in the session entitled New Water Culture One Out Two of the Second International Conference on Water, Megacities, and Global Change. The session chairs are Mr. Bilka and Mr. Agadi, who are the representative of the Omega Youth Steering Committee. Mr. Bilka and Mr. Agadi, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to me to uh, introduce the speaker uh, of this session. The first speaker is Sofia Manko. Uh, she is a master. She has a master thesis in geography and urban planning. Uh, she has 80 months experience, uh, experience in the region Ile de France in staff in charge of writing the regional urban uh, planning document. And she has also six years experiment in uh, charge of environmental and urbanistic issue at Horpa, uh, covering 26 harbors in the um, France. The next speaker will be um, uh, uh, will be Lako uh, uh, Mambedi. He graduated as an agriculture engineer with rural engineering. Uh, as a specialist, um, Lako uh, is a young Korean, Cameroonian with a master in EWRM and master of science in water management. He leads the climate and water resources De department of water for life, uh, Cameroon and Geos, uh, and his uh, activism in the global uh, network. Uh, his current research uh, fields concern sanitation, drinking water, urban wetlands, climate change, hydroclimatic risk, hydrology, and hydraulic. He also worked for YOF, uh, gender and immigration, and also he attended in, uh, several international conferences. The last speaker will be Marika Fernando. Uh, Marika has graduated as a Bachelor of Science with uh, honors in environmental science from University of Colombo in Sri Lanka, and uh, is currently um, working on the master in sustainable resource management and technical university of munich uh, she has working uh, and has uh, um, a lot of experience in environmental pioneering firms in uh, sri lanka uh, and she was mainly involved in the water footprint calculation the ghg emission reports uh, her uh, current research fields include environmental resource uh, management and water efficiency. Uh, okay, I think that we can start the first presentation. Uh, it will be mm, uh, presented by mm, uh, Sofia Manko uh, and the title is A New Water Way Transportation Culture. Merci. Merci de me recevoir. Thank you very much. Thank you for welcoming me to this uh, session dedicated to the new water culture. I will be focusing on a river or waterway uh, transport, uh, and uh, I work at the Agence Seine Amont. I am in charge of uh, communication and uh, coordination. Uh, with other entities. I'm going to be talking about uh, Europa uh, port and uh, about uh, various uh, prospects uh, that uh, we need uh, to take into account uh, with, for instance, uh, effluents uh, which are uh, released into the water, the quality of water, but also other issues uh, that have to do uh, with high or low water levels and the consequences for waterway transportation. So my uh, focus on waterway transportation will probably complement some of the other issues. What I really wanted to focus on by way of introduction is the fact uh, that uh, these do tie in with environmental considerations in many ways. I will start by presenting the Aropa Port or Port uh, Organization. Then I'll talk about waterway transportation and environmental assets. And finally, I'll be moving on to the acceptability and legitimacy of uh, economic or industrial ports on 
River Science. So Aropa Port uh, was uh, is created in 2021 through the merger of three existing entities uh, with Le Havre, Rouen, and Paris, merging their ports. It uh, currently stands the resulting entity for some 25 million tons of annual waterway uh, traffic. I, for myself, work uh, for the Paris Regional Authority. And uh, so the, the, the 25 million tons figure is, in fact, for the Paris region, alone with some 8 million passengers as well. And the reason that this Aropa port uh, was created was uh, to uh, provide a, a more level playing field. If you think about uh, ports uh, like uh, Antwerp or Rotterdam, they're more to the tunes of 400 million tons a year of transport. The idea is uh, to improve uh, the uh, working of inland ports and of the port of Le Havre uh, and to better serve uh, the 12 million inhabitants uh, of uh, the Paris region, uh, the Ile de France region, as it is called. And this is where uh, the directorate that I work for has a responsibility. We are in charge as part of this network of some 70 urban harbors uh, with multimodal platforms uh, for uh, waterway, railway, or road transport. And uh, we work together with about 65 other ports which are scattered across the territory. The point being uh, to enable uh, the operation of multiple loading and unloading points uh, so that we can be closer to uh, the final mile. Altogether, we have some 1,000 hectares of land that we manage with approximately 1 million square meters of warehouses or other buildings. Aropa Port is a public establishment, the Paris element of which was created in 1970 in order to develop and plan harbor installations in the Paris region, the Ile de France area then, dedicated to industrial and economic activity. As parts of the Paris context, uh, we have uh, restaurant uh, ships or floating restaurants, uh, terraces, uh, some uh, housing ships also, but primarily we focus on uh, port installations and industrial operations on the river's edge. We report to the Ministry of Environment and governance is shared between representatives from the state local authorities, and also the main loading companies, as well as various qualified personalities who come from NGOs and frequently environmental NGOs in particular. The tenure model is uh, based on uh, a public uh, property approach with the lands and waterways owned by uh, the state, and which cannot be sold uh, since uh, there is a specific uh, relevance to public law for these assets so that the way that we operate is that uh, the lots uh, of available land uh, are offered as part of a call for tenders and companies uh, can contract for a lease uh, for waterway transport and uh, intermodal uh, transfer. The port at the end of the lease becomes the full-fledged owner of the land once again, and we are in charge of the land development and the sustainability of uh, these land assets. So we are uh, the contact point ultimately uh, for the relevant authorities when it comes to managing these assets. So why do we need to encourage waterway transportation? It has uh, tailed off to a large extent since the 1950s, but its advantages have become apparent 
once again, particularly in environmental terms. And you can see here how many trucks it would take on the right to transport a, a corresponding number of trains above or of river uh, barges uh, uh, above yet again. In terms of price per ton, then we can see that um, waterway transport avoids considerable numbers of uh, trucks uh, on uh, the roads. It uh, is less fuel or uh, gas intensive. Um, it is also the source of fewer accidents and uh, provides considerable capacity. So there are a number of marked advantages, but we still have plenty of room for improvement to make these forms of transport even more virtuous. So we're working experimentally with uh, new approaches to electric or hydrogen engines for boats. We're working also on better equipment of the wharves, uh, which need, amongst other things, to provide power connections uh, so that uh, it is not necessary to use generators when docked. They also need to provide connections to sewer systems, particularly for cruise boats. So what uh, different areas uh, of uh, business use waterway transport and how can we increase the share of uh, multimodal transport, in particular of waterway transport. If we look at the Paris region, we can see that 80% uh, of the traffic uh, comes from construction and public works and from serial uh, producers or uh, transporters, rather. And you can see how with such materials, uh, you uh, could be tempted to use waterway transport since it becomes attractive starting from about 5,000 tons to be moved or transported. When it comes to a grain, of course, uh, there can be variations depending on each year's harvest. But when it comes to construction and public work, there are many in substantial projects on the way around Paris. And also uh, there's a new subway, as well as the prospect of the Olympic and Paralympic Games to be held in Paris in 2024. I was talking about heavy items uh, to be uh, transported. So we can provide practical solutions for moving around very heavy items such as electric transformers. We can move uh, waste, particularly uh, we can move uh, the materials that, that need to be removed from construction sites. The uh, approach is uh, focused increasingly on trying to reuse materials locally so as to cut down on using raw materials. Another uh, emerging area that we've been working on is the development of urban logistics. We work with uh, Franc Prix, which is an agro-food operator. It has uh, large warehouses out in the remote suburbs of Paris, and these are connected with waterways. For example, in Bonneuil on the Marne River, and there the uh, goods are loaded onto uh, barges or boats, so which can then transport them towards the city center, and from there uh, they can be uh, the goods can be transported, um, non-perishable goods for the most part, to actual stores. I'd like to move on now to uh, questions pertaining to the acceptability of having economic ports on riversides. Uh, increasingly, local inhabitants are reasserting their right to use uh, the banks of rivers, whether it's for swimming or other leisure activities uh, in or near uh, the water. So the question arises of how these industrial activities uh, can coexist with these new demands. The first way uh, that we can uh, deal with this uh, is that for all of our ports, uh, when we uh, 
have new ports being set up, we have to uh, ensure, first of all, uh, that there is intermodality uh, with road and rail transport. There can be synergies uh, along the river access, uh, which uh, can emerge at scale uh, with ports uh, further downstream. And there are also uh, some demands in terms of uh, architectural and environmental standards. On the picture here, you can see Bonneuil-sur-Marne, which is a 200 hectare port area. And as you can see, it's embedded in a very dense urban area and used by many different uh, uh, users. We have been working to improve its landscaping so that it is uh, perceived as more acceptable. We uh, support the companies uh, that uh, lease lots in these facilities to try to help them to meet uh, these standards uh, to provide better uh, protection for biodiversity or a uh, climate adaptation. We also support uh, companies with uh, all of the administrative aspects, uh, you know, applying for the permit for construction, environmental approval, and other formalities. Supporting companies then is one part of our work. Another is uh, to try to highlight uh, the role of uh, the ports and uh, provide for more awareness among uh, members of the public. We try to uh, organize uh, touristic cruises uh, which uh, show the workings of the harbors, uh, but also uh, the fauna and flora. You can see here again in Bonneuil-sur-Marne some work uh, on uh, restoring the riverbanks, uh, which has led to the opening up of uh, a walkway, a pathway along the riverbank. This is all about opening up uh, port spaces uh, to members of the public, but uh, in some areas you have to open up uh, to public access only at certain times when no industrial activities such as loading or unloading are in progress, primarily for reasons of safety. In 2019, some 15% of the port's budget was dedicated to such environmental projects uh, focused on biodiversity, amongst others. So it's not just about industrial installations, it's also about uh, the environmental and social responsibility of ports. Now you can see the CAP logo, uh, the Charter for Port Improvement. I was talking about supporting our clients when they uh, set up shop to make sure uh, that they uphold uh, such uh, ESR standards. We have annual independent audits, which are carried out as part of the CAP uh, and pertain to a number of different uh, issues like preventing pollution. Finally, I wanted to mention another aspect of our work as regards acceptability of ports. So we have some permanent consultative bodies uh, which are set up with uh, members including local NGOs, local authorities and some uh, local inhabitants. On the picture on the right you can see uh, the Maison du Port, literally the port house, uh, which uh, is where these consultative bodies meet. The idea is uh, to provide better information, to communicate about our projects, and also to involve uh, the various uh, stakeholders in uh, the projects of the port, which are presented to them as part of a co-development approach, and they can then provide their own insights. For example, environmental NGOs suggested uh, that uh, we could set up some uh, facilities uh, for birds uh, to be able to nest or for cyclists uh, to have better access to the platform. So these are things that we didn't necessarily have the skills 
to provide initially, but thanks to these contributions, we are able to work to provide for better acceptance of the presence of these uh, port facilities in dense urban areas. And it's part uh, of uh, master plans for sustainable land development and environmental protection. No problem. So indeed, uh, the challenges for the future, as you can see here, we uh, remain uh, certain that this uh, economic system is appropriate uh, for uh, land use and uh, for harbor management. We have somewhat limited uh, capacity with uh, almost 90% occupation of uh, our lands and it's difficult to find new sites or to provide for further densification of existing harbors, which is something of a problem. Of course, there's plenty of room for improvement for more sustainable activities. And my final, final slide is just to emphasize uh, that uh, riverway uh, waterway transport uh, provides for a virtuous environmental solutions, so notably in terms of congestion and air pollution in dense urban areas. Uh, we are taking up the challenge for uh, the different ways of using riverside spaces and replacing productive uh, activities with leisure activities, but we feel that public institutions like ours can help to develop tools for better integration between urban and environmental neighborhoods. Connection. That's why uh, we'll go to the third presentation. Uh, it will be presented by Marika Fernando, and the title is um, Challenges for Urban Tourism uh, Are the Wise? Uh, water wise. Hello, everyone. I am Marika Fernando from Sri Lanka, and today I'm going to present you our study Challenges for Urban Tourism. Are they wise water wise? I will be presenting this study uh, according to the following order. Firstly, I'll talk about uh, like an overview on tourism industry, urbanization and water, and then on uh, Sri Lanka. Shall I start now? Hello everyone, I am Erika Fernando, and today I'll be presenting you our study. Uh, can I see the screen? The presentation is not shared. Right yeah, I'll be presenting you our study challenges for urban tourism. Are they wise, water wise? And uh, moving to the summary, um, I'll be presenting you uh, an overview. <coughs> Um, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, uh, I'll be elaborating the study. Firstly, an overview on the tourism industry, urbanization and water, and then uh, a Sri Lankan perspective, it, and uh, then uh, focus methods, results and analysis. And finally, I'll give you the conclusion. Now, um, the tourism and water are closely linked. And there are several reasons why tourism sector should inculcate uh, water smart practices and create a new water culture. Firstly, uh, tourism occurs at all places of the world and is one of the fastest growing industries. And also it takes place in places already experiencing water shortage and in urban centers who are already pressurizing uh, with high water demand and deprived. And to, uh, high water usage of tourism can also cause a lot of uh, pressure and make high uh, water rich areas to water poor areas. And also, uh, on the other hand, people tend to use more water uh, when they are um, 
when they stay at hotels than they do at home uh, because the holiday making has a pleasure approach to it. So now let's see how um, the tourism sector uses water. So it, water is being uh, used for uh, washing when using toilets, wellness areas, and also in maintaining gardens and landscapes, and also for infrastructure, food, and fuel. And also in recreational activities such as swimming, sailing, kayaking, or fishing. But at the same time, there are several factors that in, uh, influence us, uh, the water use categorization of different hotels, like the geographical location, uh, which would be like uh, maybe the urban ruralness of the hotel, or maybe the climatic zone, or else the hotel structure, and maybe the comfort standards of the hotels. Now, let's narrow down our scope to the Sri Lankan perspective. Next slide, please. Um, Water lies at the very heart of the most development processes in Sri Lanka, yet there are many issues in water use in Sri Lanka. Climate change induced events become more uh, recurrent recently, and the increasing population has also caused growing demand for water. The increasing economic activity, uh, the expanding industry, diversifying agriculture, tourism, and uh, recreational interests are also becoming competitors for the available uh, water resources in the country. Uh, with this perspective, let's move on to the focus of the presentation, um, focus of the study. Uh, next slide. Um, and uh, Colombo, uh, so this study focuses on the water use of hotel industry in Colombo and compare it with hotels in the rural areas of the country. Uh, Colombo, the commercial capital of Sri Lanka, is a fast growing city with a residential population over 650,000. And uh, the Colombo district is uh, planned to uh, be turned into a mega city with the view of uh, converting Colombo as a commercial hub in the Indian Ocean. And as you can see here in the right hand side map, um, uh, the Colombo and its suburb has concentrated almost uh, like a lot of hotels in the country. And this map is created using the hotels registered for Greening Sri Lankan Hotels project. So uh, moving on to our objective, uh, it firstly, it is to investigate and compare water consumption practices in star rated hotels in Colombo with those of remote areas. And then to address how urban tourism could achieve sustainable resource management with adaptations to climate change and how hotel management could influence uh, the tourists to develop uh, a water smart culture. And then um, moving to the next slide, uh, the method, uh, there are five hotels that has been uh, used in this study, uh, which were located in Colombo and other uh, tourist attracted areas of the country. And uh, one of the co-authors visited these sites continuously during the study period and gathered information using uh, different data sources like data inventories and internal data sheets. And most of these data were found in the engineering division of the hotel. And then the secondary information uh, were uh, gathered through STEMI structured interviews, annual and sustainability reports, and also newspaper articles on uh, the hotels were also reviewed. And then uh, the industrial professionals like engineers, sustainability executives, maintenance and garden supervisors, uh, treatment plant operators, and uh, chefs and housekeeping officers were also interviewed. And they were uh, inquired about uh, the maintenance practices and uh, water smart strategies they use and the barriers they uh, face when using those strategies. Also, uh, they were inquired about the green reporting and related barriers. Uh, the boundary for the study was used, the, uh, the geographical uh, premises of the hotel was used as the boundary for the study, and the baseline year was used as uh, 2014, and the next four years were uh, compared against uh, the baseline year using the same units. And then uh, the categorization used in this study was uh, Sri Lankan Tourism Development Authority categorization. And uh, moving to the next slide, uh, I'll explain you uh, how we compare the water use. Uh, absolute consumption values, water productivity, which means the guest night per unit of water use, and water intensity, water consumption per guest night, source of water withdrawal, uh, wastewater generation, and uh, reduction measures in, uh, practiced in these hotels were studied. 
And in order to depict the resource intensity and production, um, resource production indicators, resource efficient cleaner production, RECP approach was used. This is an approach used, introduced by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and uh, United Nations Environmental Program uh, in order to uplift the cleaner production related practices in uh, the developing nations. And when calculating the resource productivity and pollu uh, pollution intensity, uh, the following order was used. Um, Firstly, as an example, uh, the absolute indicators were compute and uh, to create the relative ratios. Uh, if we take product, uh, productivity ratio, uh, the product output is divided by the resource use. And in this case, the product output is uh, the number of guest nights and the resource use is uh, the amount of water used. And then uh, the changes were compared against the baseline to track the changes. The baseline ratio of y uh, and the follow-up ratio, if the follow-up ratio is x, the percentage change z could be given as the equation two. And then the RECP profiles, industrial level RECP profiles were created for all the hotels. Moving to the next slide, um, the results and analysis of the study shows how different hotels uh, uh, inculcate water related practices and use their water and um, uh, I'll be elaborating this in detail. So uh, firstly, the first graph shows you uh, that hotels use a significant amount of water for various activities. And on the highest place, you can see uh, hotel E indicated in green, which has the highest water level. Uh, but impressively, uh, according to uh, graph A, uh, graph two and three, you can see uh, that they have the lowest intensities and also a continuous uh, improvement towards the water uh, productivity. So therefore, uh, the main reason for this is that the uh, city hotel does not gain water from their own resources and they um, totally depend on the national supply paying a tariff for their water requirements. So therefore, um, they need to have, they need to buy their water and they are more concerned in uh, water conservation measures. And uh, there was an also increasing um, identification in hotel A and B, which were in the same chain. Uh, there has been a staff change in uh, related to sustainability teams in uh, these hotels and uh, the hotel, uh, the team from Hotel uh, B has moved to Hotel A, and Hotel B has uh, continuously decreased their performance uh, even up to 29%, while Hotel A has started increasing their performance. So, this shows how uh, the uh, showcase how the hotel management and the working teams can. Uh, uh, do their do a great job in uh, water management, but in most cases, uh, these are not appreciated, and the hotel staff is not well educated about these about the impact they can make. Therefore, we uh, we would like to impress uh, we would like to um, uh, highlight the importance of uh, educating the hotel staff about the importance uh, they can make and the change they can make if. Uh, proper uh, water measures are, have been taken. And uh, moving to the next slide, um, we can see uh, the uh, water withdrawal sources of the hotels. So firstly, uh, most of the hotels source their water from groundwater sources and also from national water supply. But uh, the city hotel is the only hotel that does not have access to groundwater resources, and they totally depend on uh, national water supply for their water requirements. And um, uh, apart from a small well, they use for gardening purpose. And none of the hotels use service water for their requirements, while rainwater harvesting was not visible, unfortunately, in any of the hotels. But uh, in the city hotel, it was uh, a little bit visible, like. Uh, a small effort was taken, and this could be a great uh, water smart adaptation to combat climate change, especially in its urban settings, to reduce the risk of flood and uh, runoff, especially in the times of high rainfall. When looking towards the wastewater, uh, most of the hotels have um, their own uh, wastewater treatment plant, but uh, 
the city hotel unfortunately did not have a wastewater treatment plant because it's really impossible and difficult to uh, maintain and uh, continue a water treatment plant in a highly stressed urban center. They did, uh, even didn't have a, a basic treatment plant. They only chemically treated their water and sent it to the municipal county council, uh, council treatment plant, which is a place already stressed with a lot of uh, burden from the uh, wastewater. And also one thing I've, uh, we have noticed is that none of the hotels uh, had proper submetering. And therefore uh, the amount of wastewater generated was given as a fraction of the amount of uh, water used. But this is uh, really an uh, unprofessional way. And because it, is, uh, it has caused a lot of difficulties in generating accurate findings in researchers as well. Therefore, we would like to recommend um, submetering as a better practice and also uh, dividing the water treatment plants uh, in necessary places and uh, reducing the use of water for, uh, to reduce the burden of wastewater management. Moving to the next slide, um, we can see the practice adaptations of different hotels. And when considering the sustainable practice adaptations, most of the hotels had a satisfying level of practices. Um, low flow toilets, dual flush uh, uh, toilets, and also um, low flow shower heads, paddle taps, sensor taps were visible in almost all the hotels. But the level of adaptation differed, and in some hotels, they were only restricted to uh, public areas, while in some cases, they were also visible in the private rooms. So um, a proper energy, uh, sorry, a proper water audit could be used to um, further uh, uh, check on how these practices could affect the overall water uh, preventive measures. And also, um, uh, when considering, when uh, discussing with the visitors, it was uh, understood that uh, even though hotels proclaim that they have uh, linen recycling policies, sometimes these practices, um, even though they were asked to uh, mark their choices, they were not, uh, they were reused anyway. And in some cases, even though it is uh, proclaimed by the hotels, uh, the visitors are not even given a choice. And when we interview visitors, we understood that they were willing to uh, uh, actively participate in such practices, but most of the time these practices are um, not uh, well uh, reputed by the hotel staff and uh, not popular among the guests. And also uh, we can recommend low flow uh, shower heads and low flow taps to uh, as a very smart practice uh, for a water smart culture because this, uh, because uh, the level of water or the quantity is not what creates Rika, the satisfaction. We have, we have only a few minutes. Could you go to the conclusion of the presentation? Yeah, sure. Uh, moving on to the conclusion, um, I would like to uh, say that the results highlight that everything has a price, including water, and that it matters. Because the city hotel has the lowest water usage and a continuous progress towards water productivity because they pay for their water. And also, due to lack of space, the sewer lines of the city hotel is directly connected to the sea. And the inadequacy and, uh, of awareness rising in hotels were visible in relation to um, uh, water conservation methods, both for uh, staff and the guests. And in all hotels, some promising water conservation practices were evident, which included dual flush toilets, low flow showers and taps, and also paddle and sensor taps. Uh, guest responses revealed that uh, their willingness to participate in any water conservation measure and uh, record keeping was identified as an essential, yet uh, in all cases, this practice was uh, almost incomplete and inadequate. And also, um, Improved monitoring of water use, uh, as well as carrying out a water audit will be beneficial, uh, both environmentally and economically for hotels. And um, subwater metering will, uh, was also identified as a great measure to strengthen record keeping and to identify the areas of concern. Um, that's all about my presentation. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this great presentation. 
And uh, we'll go to the last presentation. Uh, it will be uh, the title of presentation is Enrich the Prism of Urban Management of Megacities, Water Alongside the Plot, Mobility, Environment, and Energy. And the presentation uh, will be given by Stefan Lako Mabzendu. Okay, uh, thank you. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my presentation is on enriching the prism of urban management of mega cities alongside the plot, mobility, environment, and energy. This is a contribution of the new water culture from Professor Ndongo, Professor Fonte, and I. Our presentation is going to be presented on four points. Next slide, please. Um, introduction, uh, methodology, and uh, key results and then the conclusions. As introduction, it's uh, important to say that urban planning and management in all, in all, is often based principally on demographics, energy, land, agriculture, architecture, and also on economic production with less emphasis on water resource, be it the use or the uh, impacts on water resource. There has been a rapid increase in mega cities. From the definition of mega cities with one more than one million inhabitants, we moved to 10 million inhabitants. And in 1950, we had only eight mega cities, of which in 2020, we already have 51 cities having more than 10 inhabitants and 16 that are of more than 20 million inhabitants. These uh, settlements are generally created in natural wetlands well, with less regards on the, the protection from the regulatory frameworks and is sometimes not taken into account when developing policies for urban development. And this policy has then uh, brought us to some drawbacks effects that we are facing today, like the flooding, the urban warming, but also the pollution of existing water resources, because we mainly focus on the goods and services that we have to develop, concentrating on infrastructures, land tenure, uh, also lodging and networks development. And our, as we are developing all these services, we produce a lot of waste, which generally ends up into the water courses. But the run in 1997 was already assessing that we have 400 tons of waste which are dumped in the water courses per kilometer square. So when you look at the area covered by mega cities, you can have an idea of what we produce as waste going into the water systems. And increasing, continuing with these trends, will certainly end up with a crisis that will be really difficult to handle. As the methodology, next slide please. As the methodology, we mainly focus on four points. Please, the next slide. Okay, we mainly focus on the analysis of the role of water for mega cities, that is from a landscape perspective, looking at the various uh, top mega cities. We also had to look at the top uh, 15 mega cities location and landscapes. We also looked at the complexity of urban management, looking at the fact that it can be of different skills and different uh, emphasis. And we had to look at the various principles that have been developed so far as frameworks and also approaches to urban water management so as to come up with an analytical prism for decision making uh, in urban uh, water management for mega cities. In the slides that is there, you can see that most of the mega cities that we have between 2011 and 2025 will have an increase of 17 to 53% of the demography, having more and more cities moving into mega cities and having water issues linked to the mega city. Some of the results, next slide, of, that we obtained from this analysis <clears throat> is that first, first of all, the top 15 mega cities are located in wetlands. They can be of deltas like what we have in Hong Kong, estuaries like in Sao Paulo, uh, we can also have Bay, like in Philippines, and also Peninsula, like Beijing in China. So we are building all our cities, and our cities are growing as mega cities, mainly in wetlands. Next. 
And all these cities are growing because we have various reasons that bring people to migrate uh, to the, the, the cities. And among those reasons, we have uh, the look for better jobs, looks for business opportunities. We also have look for opportunities for uh, better health, uh, also, also wealth. And with the climate, we also have climate migrations due to the fact that in some rural areas, please uh, scroll, we can have, uh, yes, yeah, thank you. We, due to climate stresses in rural areas, we have more and more people that move to cities, which seems to be more attractive. And moving to the cities means that we have more people coming in and having more people needing the goods and services which are produced by our cities. And as you can see on the picture there, most of those services and goods are developed based on water resources. And these water resources are actually provided by wetlands. So at the end, we are mainly depending on the water resource and also the resources directly from the wetland to develop cities. And as the population increase, the needs also increase, we're going to use more and more of the functions of the wetlands and the water resources for economic, social, and also financial development. Next. Okay, sorry, this is not really, yeah. So uh, responding to all these needs and increasing needs, we certainly have to develop approaches for urban management and manage unstable system equilibrium. Because from the ecological perspective, we are moving from the initial equilibrium state of the wetland without uh, man inside towards uh, various equilibrium states where the nature has to adapt to changes due to man investments, but also man has to adapt to the changes due to the natural changes. And as a result, we are mainly having to look at the various measures, practices that will help us to benefit from the environment and landscape in order to ensure the sustainability, maintain the financial, social, economic, and also environmental equilibrium states of the town, taking into account the diversity, but also the various scales and the different contexts that arise in mega cities. We then look at the, at the fact that urban management has to rely on the interdependency of resources, the, var the, var the variety of skills, the availability of resources, be it the natural resources where water is one of them, but also the complexity of the systems to manage. This then leads to various approaches, which are multi-stakeholder approaches, multi-scale responses, multi-sector approaches also. But as uh, the context is changing, as the investment are changing, as the needs are also changing and the nature adapting, there is also a change in the various models that are developed. So actually it's better to shift from the, the models approach towards a dynamic thinking approach. And to address this, we uh, think that it's really important that uh, we take into consideration current uh, discussions which are related to climate change, but also environmental protection or restoration. And as these are taken into account, there are various approaches or various discussions that are ongoing to look at how are we going to reduce the impact on the water resource and sometimes on the wetlands. Next. So in this area where we have very complex and evolving and constantly changing uh, mechanism, we think that to address it is better to rely on uh, principles because the principles is very flexible. And as principles we are suggesting to have for, first of all, to acknowledge that the mega cities are giant wetlands under construction for the welfare of human, but also sustainable nature benefits. Secondly, the managing mega cities will definitely mean managing the water budget, but also the wetland states and functions. Third, it is really important to include the wetland states and functions in the city design, planning, but also decision making processes. And four, it's, we think it's important to shift the perception of water and wetlands in mega cities from a problem perspective to opportunity and solution provided. Uh, uh, opportunities. Next. The reflection started very uh, since, and we have lots of uh, approaches, but also frameworks which were developed to address the urban water management. 
as frameworks, we uh, I can cite here four: the water wise cities, integrated water resource management, integrated urban water management, but also and very important the sustainable wetland management. If we look at the chronology in time, you will notice that the sustainable wetland management is just of recent and is rarely used in uh, the uh, thinking or planning cities. We also have some approaches which have been tested in, in projects like the switch approach, the city water resilience approach, and also the eco-hydrological uh, approach, which are three, three approach results on sustainability, but also well-being in um, frameworks are all adapting as the adaptive thinking. And this then will certainly be helpful to develop our prison, which have to take into account the landscape, the services, the networks, the infrastructures, but with two major important aspects also, which are the water resource and wetlands. And for this, we think that, next please. Okay, thanks. So that is the prism that we, we're looking at. And with this prism, we think how, that to sustainably manage water resource for mega cities is good to move to the adaptive thinking approach for sustainable water security which has to manage the assets, which are constituted of the resources, then also the attributes, the functions and the services, both of the wetlands, but also of the water resources. Let's continue clicking. And to do this, we think that for the urban, urban water managers, we have to go towards a five steps um, approach of thinking in decision-making. The first thing is first of all, to do a preliminary assessment of the needs of resources, that is the water resource and other other resources that are existing in the, in the wetlands. Then secondly, we need to do a preliminary assessment of the impacts of the investment or the decisions on the assets. And then from this impact assessment, we can take, draw, out, draw out, please continue clicking. We can draw out now, what are the required uh, uh, activities to reduce the impact to conserve the states or the functions or existing services to compensate them or to restore the assets. And that has to be added to the program, investment program. And then we have to move towards the feasibility analysis of this uh, in the additional investment and then decide on the priorities. Having this uh, in mind, that is the assets, decision process, and also the prism will probably help us to, have to make better decisions for sustainable urban water and wetland water uh, management for mega cities. So as conclusions, next please. We are saying that uh, first of all, mega cities development is a global trend with increasing number of uh, mega cities in worldwide and also increasing problems associated to the water and the wetlands assets management. Secondly, the water management in mega cities should no longer be considered only from the point of view of human needs. We also need to take into consideration uh, the ecosystem needs so as to be able to uh, manage the various equilibrium states. And it is necessary then to balance constantly and uh, to adjust to the changes that we have, be it demographic, social, economic, hydrological, ecosystemic. climatic change, but also to take into consideration the technology that if we want to address cities, it is really important to keep in mind that sustainable, attractive and resilient mega cities have to include in city design, planning and construction, some strategies for sustainable management of water and wetland assets security. Those are the points that we think is, are really important for the res sustainability of mega cities as far as the water resource and wetlands um, okay, thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Stefan Lako, for the presentation. Thank for our, our, our speakers for the great presentation on the water treatment uh, topics. Uh, we'll go directly to the 
to the session of uh, question and response. And we have one question for, for Ms. Uh, Ms. Sophie Monka sur uh, le sujet d'Europe de, en Paris. Donc, uh, uh, I will shift directly to French, parce que la, uh, la, la question est en français. Uh, the question is in French, so... Uh... Yeah, je vais, la, je vais la lire en français, donc directement. I will, uh, I will donc, read, la... it, uh, read it directly to you. OK. Ah, donc, la question dit... Uh, si la loi is... Olymp... OK. Si la loi olympique oblige la réalisation d'un réseau d'assainissement pour déserver Does les the... voitures... Olympic. Allow me to, to repeat this. Um, okay. No. Is there a law calling for the obligation of the use of a, a sanitation network? Pour désinfecter les bateaux logements et les activités d'assainissement sur Paris. Quelle est la politique? Sanitation activities in Paris. What is the policy? Quelle est la politique d'Europa sur les autres secteurs parisiens? For the other Parisian sectors. Okay. Les bateaux génèrent une pollution locale et sanitaire contribuant à la limite de la possibilité de la baignade. And what is uh, the limit for um, swimming? Thank you. Well, we won't be able to... Um, equip the entire area. It's a very, very large area, so we have to prioritize the sectors. It starts with the central area of Paris, and then we will uh, uh, extend our works and expand our works towards uh, other ports. Aropa port uh, hardly has any uh, um, Housing um, boats, it's another public institution that's in charge of that, but we are in charge of uh, leisure uh, boats and we have to propose this uh, uh, sanitation service to them, of course. Uh, and then on, I followed um, from afar the working groups on the quality of swimming waters. The contribution of boats uh, and ships is quite uh, minimal compared to uh, all of uh, the discharges of uh, sanitation of the metropolis. And the work that we are doing upstream for now is really on uh, uh, separating uh, the different uh, uh, connections and uh, solve the issues when used waters are accidentally connected to the river waters. This is the main uh, failure factor for the quality of swimming water. And this is really where uh, most of the investment is concentrated. Okay. Uh, answer for this question and uh, Marika your presentation was connected with challenges for uh, urban tourism and connection uh, between the tourism and uh, water wise idea I have a question for you uh, what are the main barriers to water and tourism researchers at the city level uh, actually, the most uh, challenging problems are that uh, in city level, it is really difficult to construct and maintain uh, wastewater treatment plants, and therefore the hotels have to, um, uh, they are unable to uh, treat their own wastewater, further uh, making more challenges on the highly urbanized uh, urban centers. And uh, so uh, one of the main challenges is related to wastewater management, and also um, in relation to record keeping, I think uh, it's not something that is just restricted to the city hotels or the urban centered <laughs> hotels, uh, but uh, there's a lot of pressure and the hotel staff should uh, put more energy and effort on keeping uh, the record keeping at a uh, like uh, a continuous uh, record keeping um, is something that has not been practiced in most of the hotels and it's really important to have such practice. Okay, and what are your suggestions for a better uh, water culture in the tourism sector? Uh, 
uh, yeah, uh, when considering a better suggestion for the tourism sector and uh, the tourism and water related researchers, I would like to recommend uh, using more um, tools because when uh, trying to assess these uh, water usage related issues, uh, I find that I found that it is uh, difficult to find a better tool. And uh, finally, I was able to come up with this UNIDO and UNEP related approach. So uh, the researchers must, must engage in uh, uh, kind of uh, more uh, using tools like that. And also um, uh, when considering the hotels, they should be um, uh, using more uh, of a record keeping approach and also an innovative approach to the measures they take. And also when considering the policy makers, I think it is important to increase the tariff uh, for the hotels because in Sri Lanka, uh, like uh, from the total water, uh, from the total expenditure, water only accounts for like 5%. So therefore, the interest is really less for uh, the water management reduction practices. So therefore, uh, increasing the tariff uh, is very important. And also, uh, there should be a proper award scheme or something like that for the uh, hotels that take better concessions to uh, reduce their water consumption. Okay. Thank you. And maybe one more question, because you talk about um, the water efficiency um, and yeah. you use uh, some methodology to, to measure the, the efficiency of water use. Um, and maybe do you try to, to compare your methodology with some uh, international standards, because there are several uh, methods for labeling water efficiency and maybe you can try to use in your research or, or do you try to use this this kind of methodology to adopt this kind of methodology also in, in your uh, research or to compare your methodology with other standards uh, you mean i have tried to compare my uh, findings with other standards right uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh, there was one study as i can remember in uh, carried out in the african region and they have also uses uh, the similar like recp practice uh, RECP approach to their studies and we have found kind of similar uh, results so uh, I therefore I kind of validated my findings um, and uh, but some other tools like to measure this I uh, I'm not sure like the collection is clear to me so with regard to RECP I have validated it yes and also there's a, a guideline book and uh, the findings could be um, compared with that and that's sort of a benchmark to uh, compare the findings so yes okay thank you very much thank you and um, mr mom ben do um, you present in your presentation a, a several framework for water management in the mega city uh, you work in a several young water organization and my question is uh, how is the role of uh, young people in, in creating a water wise city in uh, mega cities and is there any um, uh, framework uh, for young water professionals or uh, any, any guides for young water professionals to, in uh, sustainable management in, in the mega cities? I, th um, I think I should go ahead with a general question for all the speakers until we wait for to, to join us. Okay, I have general question for all the speakers. So, uh, what are the best strategies and best uh, lesson learned for development uh, from developed countries in regard to water use, water treatment, and water conservation in urban area and mega, mega cities. In my case, I feel like uh, the best practices are to uh, keep track on uh, your water usage and um, uh, the record keeping is identified as the best measure to uh, 
uh, understand how the water is used. And also in a lot of other industries, I recommend using submetering uh, because in different departments, uh, you can measure how the water is, uh, water usage has uh, uh, varied and uh, how the different departments use varying degrees of water for different activities. And you can keep, tra you can keep track on that and also uh, use it for comparisons. And uh, on the other hand, I think um, it is important to, um, apart from submetering, uh, submetering can also help in uh, identifying any uh, shortages or leakages very quickly, and therefore uh, would be very beneficial in uh, reducing the consumptions. And um, yeah. Uh, well, to complement that answer, it's true that um, mm, raising awareness of uh, individuals and uh, uh, inhabitants is, is essential. Informing people on uh, the use of water is essential. And on governance, well, these are topics that should be uh, discussed at this, the, the catchment area level and not the territorial uh, communities. Uh, but this is being done increasingly, but uh, it should be uh, done uh, all the more. Um, private urban planners should also be uh, informed, educated on uh, the challenges of uh, water and filtration, uh, which uh, leads to less rejections, less discharges, uh, um, from sanitation specifically, and uh, should we want to participate in the inc um, improvement of uh, uh, river water or, or rainwater, we can improve the use and reuse of this water for gardening, uh, domestic household usages, uh, for uh, toilets, for example. I believe that for now it is not yet possible because of um, the standards that don't allow for it. Uh, thank you so much for for the for the answers. Uh, they were very helpful to us. Um, I think we, Mr. Lako, has uh, we have missed Mr. Lako, so, so we are going directly to to the conclusion. So uh, I would like to thank all our attendees for for attending this session, and uh, I hope that you have uh, like it. And uh, now we need to move, move, move ahead and we need to work. Thank for our, for our speakers for the great presentation and uh, we see you very soon. Thank you very much, Mr. Belka, Mr. Agadi and all speakers for the interesting presentations. And thank you dear participants for your attention and interest. But stay online three more parallel sessions will start at 11 to discuss about the second part of the new water culture, metro care challenge, and the second part of innovative and initiatives. Thank you very much. Nous vivons un moment historique. Jamais le devenir de l'humanité n'a été aussi intimement lié aux impératifs écologiques. Il y a urgence. Le climat se dérègle, les ressources naturelles se raréfient, la biodiversité s'effondre. Oui, la maison brûle. Désormais, tout le monde le sait, tout le monde le dit. Maintenant, il faut agir. Une partie des solutions concrètes et à fort impact existent déjà. Nous avons plus que jamais besoin des acteurs industriels pour en accélérer le déploiement. D'autres problèmes restent à résoudre. Nous devons mettre tout en œuvre pour inventer les solutions de demain. Nous devons aller au-delà de la seule transition car nous n'avons plus le temps d'adapter graduellement nos façons de faire. Pour réconcilier environnement et développement humain, nous devons faire des choix nets, difficiles, structurants. C'est pourquoi Veolia nourrit une ambition plus haute, plus forte, plus exigeante aussi, la transformation écologique. La transformation écologique, c'est l'adaptation radicale de nos modes de production et de consommation. C'est mettre les au cœur de tous les processus, de toutes les délibérations, de tous les arbitrages. C'est développer les solutions radicales et utiles pour relever les défis essentiels de l'humanité. Décarboner l'industrie pour lutter contre le réchauffement climatique. Promouvoir l'économie circulaire pour lutter contre la raréfaction des ressources. Dépolluer l'air, l'eau, les sols, sauvegarder la biodiversité et enfin inventer une agriculture plus économe en ressources. Rien de tout cela ne serait possible sans l'action coordonnée de toutes nos parties prenantes. 
nos 180 000 salariés, bien sûr, mais aussi nos clients, nos actionnaires, nos partenaires et plus largement la société dans son ensemble. Engagés dans une démarche de performance plurielle, nous sommes convaincus que les impératifs économiques, environnementaux, sociaux et sociétaux doivent former un tout indissociable. Dépolluer, assainir, purifier, recycler, valoriser, préserver et faciliter l'accès aux ressources, depuis toujours, Veolia conçoit les solutions capables de construire un avenir meilleur et plus durable pour tous. Aujourd'hui, nous voulons devenir l'entreprise de référence de la transformation écologique. Notre ambition est immense, notre détermination aussi. La transformation écologique, c'est notre raison d'être. This is an historic moment. Never has humanity's future been so closely entwined with environmental concerns. This is urgent. Our climate is changing. Natural resources are running out. Biodiversity is collapsing. Our house is on fire. We all know it. Everyone is talking about it. Now we must act. Practical, high-impact solutions already exist. Now more than ever, we need industrial players to accelerate their deployment. But other problems remain to be solved. We must do all we can to invent the solutions of tomorrow. We must go beyond transition. There is no time left for gradually changing our methods. To reconcile the environment and human development, we must make decisive, difficult and structuring choices. That is why Veolia aspires to a larger, higher, more challenging ambition, ecological transformation. Ecological transformation means genuinely adapting our patterns of production and consumption. It means placing ecology at the art of every process, every assessment, every decision. It means developing radical, meaningful solutions to meet humanity's existential challenges. Decarbonizing industry to combat climate warming, promoting the circular economy to combat resource depletion, decontaminating the air, water and soil, protecting biodiversity and creating a more resource efficient agriculture. None of this would be possible without the coordinated action of all our stakeholders, our 180,000 employees of course, but also our customers, our shareholders, our partners and wider society as a whole. We are committed to delivering a multifaceted performance and convinced that economic, social and environmental concerns must form an indivisible whole. Decontaminating, sanitizing, purifying, recycling, recovering, conserving, and facilitating access to resources, Veolia has always worked to create solutions capable of building a better, more sustainable future for all. Today, we want to become the benchmark company for ecological transformation. Our ambition is huge, but so is our determination. Ecological transformation, that is our purpose.